good afternoon everything in the universe is made of matter and so everything in the universe is made of atoms with this i welcome everyone for the 48th episode of creative weekend talks i am supriya nayaka hosting this program creative creative is a group of curious minds who are eager to gain new knowledge and creative means cre means creativity active means keeping activeness so creativity keeps us active is the creative knowledge square is our tagline squaring sharing of knowledge increases our knowledge is the tagline a vision of creative to build constructive thinking and progress in various fields and we are focusing on non textual non academic and non syllabus concepts creative creating opportunities to the resource person to share their views discoveries experimental results and many more with the interesting audience i take this opportunity to thank all our resource person for engaging us with their knowledge today's topic is atom gateway to the universe we are conducting uh, a weekend online talks every saturday from 4 uh, 3 to 4 pm and be live streaming uh, in our youtube channel and uh, to, uh, today's topic uh, atom gateway to the universe the atomic physics has changed uh, over time as new technologies have become available from the era of ancient greek philosophy to modern quantum mechanics the atomic theory has made multiple updates each of which was quite revolutionary for its time to know more about this uh, we have energetic speaker today mr satyajit sir uh, i call uma devi to introduce our speaker and welcome all our creative participants over to uma thank you ma'am a very good afternoon to everyone present here with warm greetings it is indeed a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome on behalf of creative team conducting wonderful talk on atom gateway to the universe by a resource person a man with a great vision and mission dr satyajit kd he pursues a profession of associate professor in department of physics at nmeam institute of technology karnataka sir has received his phd from bangalore university on experimental atomic physics he has ample experience in teaching as he worked as an associate professor in amrita vishwa vidyalayam coimbatore as a guest faculty in bangalore university as a lecturer in surana college pes college alvas college st alosis mangalore university and sdm college with a great geniality he built and exhibited ac trap in national science congress bangalore university held from 1st to 6th january 2003 built a low cost scanning fabric perot interferometer for student laboratory set up an experiment to trap micro sized dust particles and measure q by m using an ac trap set up fabry perot etalon experiment spectroscopy for msc department of physics bangalore university his interest includes ion trapping dust particle traps and quantum computations his publications includes energy distribution of electrons under axial motion in a in a quadrupole trap penning trap in a canadian journal of physics in october 2016 and many more his projects includes low cost scanning fabry perot interferometer in april 2003 and loading detection and a number estimation of an electron plasma in a penning trap in 2009 our ecstatic and enthusiastic guest has been awarded with a best thesis award in atomic and molecular physics field during dae brns symposium darwad in february 2011 cheers to you sir and once again welcome you sir i extend my welcome to shriya sir who has been the backbone of this program supriya ma'am our supportive system and all the creative members who are all gathered here to add radiance to the occasion once again i welcome you all thank you thank you ma thank you very much over to you sir Uh, th- thank you very much hope i am audible yes sir yes sir go ahead sir okay uh, so thank you very much for the kind introduction so i would uh, start my lecture now i i on behalf of uh, myself and my institution where i work i uh, very thankful for uh, shrinath 
for inviting me to this topic, uh, this particular creative lecture, where I'm going to share my uh, little bit of knowledge about atomic physics and uh, its connected areas. So I also welcome a lot of my students and other people who might have gathered here. So I would like to share my presentation now. Uh, just hold on, hold on. So is my screen shared? No, sir. No, sir. Is not shared? No, sir. One no. minute. One second, I'll share it again. Huh. Okay, I think it should yes, be sir. Yes, sir. So, are you able to uh, see my screen? Slide mode. Presentation mode, sir. Is it in the presentation mode? Yes, sir. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the talk on Atom, a gateway to the universe. So, it's a talk given for the wonderful creative group. So, in this talk, I'm going to uh, discuss about the concept of Atom and how this idea of Atom can uh, bring oneself to understand more about the universe. So my talk is in the form of a story. Uh, it's a science story. So all of you can sit back and relax. It is aimed at a, uh, I would say, slightly well-informed common man. It's not a very scientific talk in the sense, I'm not going to use a lot of equations and derivations and so on, but there will be some, uh, some physics involved, but uh, at a very basic level, all of you will be able to understand. So, to begin with, we have a, a very famous statement from William Blake, okay, who was a poet who says this, that to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So it's a very metaphysical poem. Uh, it says that, is it possible to hold a grain of sand and you can, is it possible to see the whole world in that grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower and hold infinity in the palm of your hand. So I take this as an inspiration to explore into the universe through something which is very small, which is an atom. And most of us know what an atom is, but I'm assuming that we do not know and we start the journey back in time and take this ahead in the form of a story. So let's begin the story. But before we, before we begin the story, uh, I have to tell you something important because this is a story of science. So science has some basic assumptions. So I have listed some of the most important ones here. Science believe, believes that there is an objective reality. And this objective reality is something which uh, is governed by the natural laws. And these uh, natural laws can be understood by observation and experimentation. And every, every phenomena, natural phenomena, always has a natural cause. Not every time, for example, uh, human beings might do something which may not be included as a natural cause, but Normally, when, when you talk about objects, there is always a natural cause behind it. So what is the meaning of this? The meaning is that uh, objective reality as opposed to subjective reality. For example, I say that someone is good, someone is bad, someone is handsome. So these are subjective reality. It is dependent on the sub person who is giving the opinion. But when you say objective reality, it means that it is not dependent on the person who is saying it. For example, he is... Uh, 
his height is 183 centimeters. It's an objective reality. Anybody can check that. It doesn't depend on the person who is observing him. So, and such an objective reality, which you can measure, quantify, is governed by the natural laws. So the endeavor of physics or science has been to find out what these natural laws are. These are not laws framed by human beings, just like the laws that you uh, we talk about it. This is a pattern that nature imposes on material phenomena. So this is done through experimentations and th that experiments will be eventually uh, be understood by a very uh, clearly laid out mathematical structure, a mathematical theory. So keeping this in the back of our mind, let us start our story. So the first chapter of our story begins in 1600 approximately and runs up to 2009. So who is the person who is the first character in our story is Isaac Newton. So his period is 1643 to 1727. And he gives the most famous equation a physical ME, that equation that rules the world for the next 350 years. Why is this equation so important? Why this equation rules the world for 350 years? That's something very important for us to know. As I told you earlier, uh, we have a quest to understand the natural phenomena and try to understand what natural phenomena, phenomena is and how do we predict uh, natural uh, phenomena. Okay, and For example, how do we predict weather? How do we predict earthquake? So let us start with something simple. So Newton says that if you give me an object and if you give me the forces that act on that, you just have to use a physical MA and the solution is uh, something which tells you about the motion of that object in the future. Suppose you have a trajectory like this. Imagine it could be anything. It could be throwing a ball. It could be dropping an apple. It could be even launching a satellite. So you have the starting point, the position, let's say X naught and the time, let's say T naught is given and the force acting on that object is known, then you simply equate it with the Newton's law and you can precisely predict the trajectory of such an object in space. So this is the claim of Newton. So for example, let us take a spring which is oscillating back and forth on a smooth frictionless surface. What would be its uh, motion? Okay. Probably you already know that its motion is sinusoidal. How do you actually find out that? How do you quantify, exactly pinpoint where the object will be after a certain period of time. So it's a very simple and very powerful uh, method. You take the force acting on this object, which is the restoring force, which is the Hooke's law, Kx. So Kx means minus Kx means the force acting on that mass is proportional to the displacement and it is in the opposite direction. That's why minus sign. We equate it with MA. MA is nothing but M into d square x by dt square because that's acceleration. So don't get, don't worry too much. I'm not going to do too much of mathematics. But this particular equation in the box shows the power of Newton's law. So on the left hand side, you have the restoring force, and the right hand side, you have the Newton's second law, the force that says F is equal to MA. And when you solve this equation, so this is called the equation of motion which tells you how the mass is going to move. When you solve this equation, you will get the solution in this form, which will tell you precisely how the object moves, which is given by the sinusoidal curve. Now, this is the prescription for predicting the future trajectory of any object. As I pointed out, it could be an apple falling, it could be a satellite being put in orbit. Everything, every possible thing that you can imagine can be solved by following this procedure. Take the object, you know the forces acting on them, and you apply the Newton's law, solve the, uh, obtain the equations of motion, solve the equations of motion, which is a second order differential equation, and you have the solution, which tells you how the object moves. Isn't it wonderful? In fact, uh, you can even write an equation for a flower which is blooming if you know the exact forces acting on the flower. So this equation was so powerful that literally everything, as, as long as it's not human beings or animals, every inanimate object's motion could be predicted precisely using the 
Newton's law. But there is a hitch. So it is applicable only to the bigger objects. Now the question is, what is big? Okay, so big and small is a relative term. So in physics, we do not use the word big and small. Uh, we might use it, but we have to specify what exactly we mean by big and how exactly uh, we measure that and what is the size. So for example, if you look at this, uh, it's, it's a Bahubali statue, Shavana Balagala statue, which is uh, 65 feet tall. So it's typically uh, a person could be five feet, eight inches on an average uh, height of a person. 12 times the height of a person. But if you take the same person and look at the ant on its, his feet, he would be 1,000 times bigger than an ant. If you consider the height of the man is some five, five and a half feet and an ant about 2 mm, it is 1,000 times bigger. So you know that the sizes are only relative in nature. So you one has to exactly pinpoint what is meant by big and what is meant by small. So, for example, if you look at the size of the sun, it is 696, 340 kilometers. It's a very huge object. Whereas compared to the size, Earth's size is only 6,000, approximately 6,371 kilometers. So it's much smaller than that. Now if you take the tip of a nail, now we are coming down smaller and smaller and smaller. We have gone to the ant, it's 2, two mm across. You come to the tip of a nail, which is approximately, let's say, 0.1 mm in its uh, dimension. So how many atoms would be there in that? So it's a very simple calculation. So if you take a uh, hydrogen atom, for example, of course, it would be the uh, size of an angstrom. If you make a small calculation, you can find out that the size of the tip of the nail is one uh, million times bigger than that. So there are about million iron atoms. If the nail is made of iron, there will be million iron atoms in the tip of the nail. So let us uh, now fix what is the meaning of big. When I say big now, henceforth, when I say big, it means anything that is bigger than 0.1 micrometer, remember anything that is bigger, it's not a very precise boundary because uh, because of various reasons, which uh, if anybody is interested, I would like to tell you later, but it is not a very sharp boundary, but you can say that approximately about 0.1 micrometer, starting from that, which is about 100 nanometers, okay? So anything bigger than this, anything bigger than this is big up to the size of the sun or size of the solar system, which is millions of times bigger than. If you look at the diameter of the solar system, it is, uh, I think, uh, a billion times bigger than. Uh, let me just check. So uh, from the sun to earth, suppose you take the distance from sun, sun to earth, it's about 150 million kilometers. Okay. So, the solar system is 1 million times bigger than the distance that is between the sun and earth. So just to give you a perspective about how huge uh, the, the scope of the Newton's law is, the movement of the planets which move around the sun, they follow Newton's law, the same Newton's law that will govern the movement of a dust particle. So on the left hand side, you see I have shown some small, small particles the dust particle. Suppose you take a dust particle and drop it, the Newton law will tell you how exactly the particle will fall. And the same law is applicable to the movement of the uh, planets also, but in accordance with the gravitational law. Of course, you are aware of the gravitational law, right? So, but the trajectories can be worked out using the Newton's laws. Now, we come to the chapter two. Okay, so what, what did we learn in the chapter one? We learned in the chapter one that every natural phenomena, starting from a dust particle to a large object like sun or earth, 
its its motion or even satellite its motion can be precisely calculated by newton's laws which is called the classical physics but now the second chapter starts which i call the explorations and the beginning of this is approximately 1800 to 1900 so what is this all about why am i now coming to a second part in the physics as far as the story is concerned okay now here there are a certain questions that one needs to uh, be clear about now i told you that a dust particle or a satellite it will obey the newton laws newton's laws now the question is what about the motions within the material suppose you take a material okay inside the material suppose you take a paper and burn the paper the paper becomes ash now what forces are involved in this process so if you ask that question what about the dynamics of the particles within the material do they follow the newton's law so that is the question that we are asking so keep that question in your mind when we go through the second chapter so this starts with the following uh, question in mind if you look at the wonderful uh, universe around you the multitudinal variety of substances there are stones there are animals there are trees there are crystals it's a colorful universe now the question that one would ask in the past people asked is are there millions of materials or are there only a few materials out of which all these materials are made of now this thought goes back to the 6th century so the century uh, kanada he is a founder of uh, a school of thought called vaishashika he is a founder of that and it goes back to that period where the question was asked whether materials are made of atoms he he called them anu of course there is a bit of a question whether his formulation of atom or anu is metaphysical in nature but i will not dwell uh, too much into that uh, i'm just mentioning because there is a mention of the anu in the vaishashika system similarly in the 341 bc approximately that is the period of uh, greek philosopher called epicurus he believed that uh, materials are made of atoms now in the second portion the second chapter we will see how gradually people uh, came to the concept of this atom by sheer experimentation okay now the second question that one asks along with the question of how many materials there are there in the universe is why there are so many colors if you look at the sunset sunrise there are so many colors why there are so many colors does the color tell us any story does the light tell us a story so that's a question that we so these are the two questions uh, we have in mind in this chapter 2 so i start with the story of an inquisitive boy his name is fraunhofer when he was very small he is very fond of playing with uh, lenses and mirrors he starts wondering why the sky is so colorful why the rainbow has seven colors in it and so on and unfortunately he uh, there is an earthquake or some natural calamity he loses his house his house falls down and he'll be standing outside his house and the king of the house king of the nation happens to pass by and he sees this uh, small kid and asks who is this person and some of them say that he is fraunhofer uh, joseph von fraunhofer that's his full name and he is he is very fond of uh, playing with uh, lenses and mirrors so the king becomes very uh, sorry for his uh, situation and he gives him a large sum of money unlike other children probably had you got this money would have probably gone and bought some nice phone and stuff like that but he didn't do that he bought actually a glass grinding machine because he wanted to make better and better lenses so he started studying he was studying the sunlight under a very carefully constructed uh, telescope okay so he was studying this sunlight and he was using a spectrometer to analyze the various components of the sunlight so he bought a glass grinding machine to make better lenses so that he can analyze the sun's light in a better way in fact this is one 
uh, actual Joseph uh, von Fraunhofer's lab where he was doing all these experiments. In fact, what he did is he studied the uh, absorption lines of sun. So absorption line means you have, when you look at the sunlight, it looks white, which means it has all colors in it. So suppose you pass it through a prism, you know that the prism splits the uh, white color, which is the composite color, into all its constituent colors. So you'll see all the colors, the way they are. That's what uh, a rainbow does when the rain droplet, which is falling under gravity, is approximately like a you know, uh, prism through which when the light passes, you see all the so-called seven colors, but there are millions of colors in them. But when you observe them carefully under a spectrometer, you will see certain places the lines are missing, the colors are missing, it looks dark. So that's called an absorption line. And he names all this the meticulously by the letters A, B, C, D, and so on. And uh, there, are, there are two lines which are very close by. He will call them, for example, there is a line in D, so very closely spaced. He will call them D1 and D2. <clears throat> okay. But he also has a technological offshoot. This, this particular experiment that he was doing, what he did was, whenever the, the lines in the the, the dark lines in the spectrum was not very clearly seen. He took it as a yardstick to talk about the quality of the prism. If the quality of the prism is not good, the lines are not properly visible. So he used the appearance of these dark lines as a yardstick to improve the quality of the prism because of which his prisms got demand all over Europe to make binoculars and so on. You know that prisms make very good binoculars because their reflection is very high and you don't have the problem of polishing the surfaces like mirrors and so on. So uh, I just uh, put a small uh, pointer here, which says 1823. 1823 was the first uh, you know, uh, binocular which was uh, made. So you can just compare that with the timings. So he is, it's almost the end of his uh, life that the actual commercial binoculars appeared, but it had, to, it had a lot of things to borrow from the research of uh, Fraunhofer, which was actually not the reason why he was doing them, but he eventually found out that the position of these lines become very crucial for the quality of the prisms. But what he was doing, however, was something to study the absorption lines of the sun. Meanwhile, there is another experiment that was going on that was done by a person called Kirchhoff. I think all of you have seen what is called a Bunsen burner in the chemistry lab. You see the flame on the left hand side. If you pass this light that's coming out of this flame into a uh, into a prism, you will see two bright lines, lines which are yellow in color. And if you look at the position of the frequency of these lines, okay, so there is a way to translate the positions of uh, the, uh, the the physical position, the spatial positions of the light that is dispersed from the spec, uh, spectrometer. I think most of you who have studied BSC would know how to do this. The positions of the lines which appear on the screen can be correlated with the wavelength or the frequency. So the exact position where the D1 and D2 lines, dark lines appeared on the sun's spectrum, the absorption spectrum, the same position, there were two yellow lines, D1 and D2, in the spectrum of a uh, Bunsen burner. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, what these spectrums are, the first one shows if you pass the entire light through a prism, you should see a continuous spectrum. But if the gas is hot, what will happen is it will emit certain particular wavelengths only. So you will see what, what are called these emission spectrums, which are particular specific colors. But if you introduce in front of a source of light, a cold gas, the cold gas will absorb certain lights. Okay? And when they absorb certain lights, the final light that comes out, continuous light, has some missing components in that. So wherever that is missing, you will see those lines. So you can see that this is what Fraunhofer was, the bottom one is what Fraunhofer was looking at. 
which seems to suggest that suppose this is the sunlight around the sun there is some cold gas the surrounding region of the sun is cold and therefore certain lines in the continuous spectrum are missing and what lines he mentioned as a b c d are the lines of the uh, absorption spectrum absorbed by the outer cold layer of the sun and of course these are these are things which we know now it wasn't known in those days he just knew that there are absorption lines and the one in the middle so this is the emission spectrum which is got by analyzing the light coming from the bunsen burner now you see the power of correlation this is where the wonderful thing comes in totally two different experiment one is light coming from the sun absorption spectrum one is light coming from the bunsen flame when you put them together you see that there are two yellow lines d1 and d2 exactly at the same position in the spectrum where the two lines black lines in the sun's spectrum and also they found that these two yellow lines appeared in the chemistry lab only when they uh uh when there was sodium in the uh, substance that was burnt in the gas so immediately they they found out they correlated that this must therefore belong to a sodium and therefore there must be sun there must be sodium in the sun see the beauty of the correlation sitting 150 million kilometers away not knowing what the sun is and just by looking at two different experiments and correlating them they were able to say that there is sodium in the sun so this is the first glimpse when i say atom as a gateway to the universe the first glimpse that just by sheerly understanding the light that is coming out of the sun through a small prism one can uh, find out what is the material that is present in the sun of course they did not know what material means and what whether there are atoms that was not known but the new materials the new metals people were using metal the metal age onwards people were using materials but they did not know what was inside the metal of course so now every material has its own signature they found out that every material has its own signature pattern so mercury has its pattern helium has its pattern sodium has its has its pattern but why does it have that pattern that wasn't known but if you get a light out of a material it is sure that if the light has that particular pattern then definitely uh then definitely you know that uh, that material exists in that particular uh, source meanwhile a quest for uh, classifying materials began people started wondering so other question i am talking about now are there million materials in the world you know that it is mendeleev in 1869 who arranged all these materials in a nice form and he found that there are in those days approximately 108 elements by classifying sheerly through their atomic weight okay they did not know anything about atoms remember those days it was not really called atomic number they were weights it was thought that hydrogen is the basic one and everything else is made up of a large number of hydrogen atoms that is what they thought about and they arranged it in a in a form and they found that these many elements there are no millions of materials in the world but there are only 108 elements in the world out of which all the fantastic variety of materials in the world is made of okay now coming back to the same uh, thing that fraunhofer was doing a develop they developed a branch called spectral analysis by which you can actually analyze the light coming from not only sun but all other Uh, stars and find out what exactly is the composition of the star so it is something like writing the horoscope of the star you can get all details of the composition of the star eventually people could even say uh, the death and birth of the star and so on using chandrashekhar's theory which of course is not a part of the story but uh, you should be aware of this so i am coming to the now the third chapter now what did we learn in the second chapter we learned in the second chapter that all these materials millions of materials are not made of millions of materials but only 108 materials and every material has its own characteristic line formation or patterns which we can observe i'll take a small 2 minutes uh, intermission uh, and i take any questions if you have so i have two more chapters which will not take so much of time <clears throat> if anybody audience has any questions i would be very happy to take 
If anybody have, you have question, any quick, uh, you can. Uh, okay, Dinesh sir, one minute. You can ask, sir. Yeah, Satya, good evening. Yeah, hi, okay. My son has a doubt. Yes. Uh, yes. and Tandra stars, sella green color star or mathe color sella ira de lala star sella. He is asking, okay. pestering me. That was his doubt. Why? So how can I get that? Okay, so that is because see the stars and rays, the tumba door ayer odrin na, the adrin the baron the light nam karne can't see dilla. It's very very feeble. So in order to get that, you have to use special kind of a photography. You have to expose that for a long period. It's something called exposure. You have to expose a, uh, the uh, you know the camera to the sun for a long period. Only when enough photons will fall on the screen, and you will be able to see that. So when you analyze that, only you will be able to see the various colors present in it. Now, barigane can't see it. It look almost whitish in color if you see. But white color, just like sunlight, has all other components in it. Similarly, the starlight also has other components in it. Yes. Uh, I'm so I'm sorry. I'm hello. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Please. Yeah. I'm, late, I'm, late. Sorry for, I'm sorry for actually um, taking up whatever the question that the earlier person asked. So he might be actually talking about the overall color of the star itself. May not be at not atomic lines or other lines. So some yeah. of the stars look bright, uh, whitish uh, blue, some look yellow, and uh, maybe that's what he's asking. If that's the question, then uh, the temperature of the star determines the temp uh, color of that. Exactly. Very, very true. So that is how I mean, the, the, when you do the spectral analysis, it basically is uh, the temperature, which is something like a black body radiation. So where you have the peak of the black body shifted to uh, different uh, positions in the, in the star. But since I think he is not aware of all these things, I was not uh, going into those uh, details. But you are very right. Thanks for that answer. So thank you so much. So anybody else? Okay. So you can also ask the questions at the end. There would be time for asking questions. I am stopping here because if you have something, uh, clarifications or something, you can ask me. Or you can even stop me in the middle. There's no problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me go ahead. Uh, I will continue with the presentation. Are you able to see the uh, presentation? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Now let's come to the third part. This is where uh, the actual clarity about atoms starts beginning. Okay. So there are many puzzles which occur, uh, as uh, rightly pointed out by Girish. So this basically there's something called a black body radiation. Sun is also like a black body. It essentially, means that uh, black body is something which absorbs all the colors. And also, therefore, emits all the colors. So, sun emits all the colors. So, if you look at this spectrum, people found that at different temperatures, it will have different peaks. So, if you look at this graph, you can see that as the temperature changes, it corresponds to a different graph. So, you will see the peak peak at different positions. In fact, the peak starts moving towards the uh, lower wavelengths, which means there is a shift towards a blue color from the red color as the temperature increases, which is called the Wien's displacement law. And the color of the star, of course, looks the prominent color of the peak of this black body radiation. Now, people were wondering how this black body radiation is happening. So now, going back to the question, everything was explainable through Newton's laws. Now, can we explain what is happening inside a material as, as uh, 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 we are talking? Suppose a material is hot, something is happening inside the material. Can the dynamics be explained through the Newton's law, F is equal to MA? That's a question. So many people tried doing it. Nobody succeeded. So nobody could use that simple, beautiful equation, F is equal to MA, to understand what is happening inside the material. Okay, It has wonderful answers to what is happening outside, how the material falls, how the material. But what is happening inside the material? Can we use F is equal to MA? The answer is no. Nobody was able to do that. So, But it was the first time in... Uh, 1905, approximately in that period, that 
Max Planck was able to give this equation E is equal to h nu. He said the the material has oscillators, and these oscillators oscillate with this these frequencies, which are basically not continuous. They are discrete. They are quantized. But he was not able to come up with a solid theory to explain it. He was only having this equation, which he took out of his hat, out of nowhere. But it was able to perfectly explain the black body radiation. And there comes the second genius, Niels Bohr. He says, "Let us connect what Fraunhofer did and what Mendeleev did, and put them together." Now, on one side, you have a question of the nature has so many uh, millions of materials, but they are made of only one or eight materials. On the other side, you have so many colors, and these colors somehow belong to the materials. So he said, therefore, the colors have something to do with the atoms, and every material is made of atoms, and the atoms will have energy levels, and these energy levels are discrete. That is because of Max Planck's equation; they are not continuous, and therefore, when an electron jumps from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, it will emit in the form of Photon, which is given by H nu, and this is a wonderful uh, theory which connects these two different concepts of matter and energy, atom and light, which nobody was able to connect. Bohr was the first person to connect them and say that whatever comes out of the atom comes out because of the transitions of electrons from different states in the atom. So this is the first time that people had a picture of what an atom is. but still we do not have any particular equation or anything that governs the movement of atoms within a particular material so there comes two giants erwin schrodinger and werner werner heisenberg and these are the two people who are able to answer this question and this is a very 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 exciting topic i will not go deeper into this but i'll just mention that this radically departures from the existing classical physics the f is equal to ma equation how does it differ okay if you take a car the car is moving it can be associated with the momentum p which is a variable so it's just a number heisenberg said no if it is an atom you cannot do this it cannot be just a number but a set of numbers called a matrix so now onwards if you are talking about the movement of materials within the material what the moment is happening you cannot do that with the help of just the numbers or a variable but you have to use what is a matrix in fact he was not aware of what a matrix is he said array of numbers later dirac and other people were pointing out that these are matrices and heisenberg formulated what is called matrix mechanics when ob objects move in the microscopic world they cannot be represented with sing single numbers but a matrix on according to this now comes the equation which replaces a physical ma in the microscopic world which hsi is equal to esi so this is called the schrodinger's time independent equation let's not go into deep into this equation but this equation is a vector equation where psi is a column vector and h is a matrix okay so what you see here is matrix and vector equation vectors and matrices are equivalent in nature you can write a vector in the form of a matrix so h is a matrix and psi is a uh, vector and e is a number energy is a number which you can measure so this equation is a governing equation to find out the motion of objects in a microscopic world but there is a very important difference you have to throw out the idea of trajectories you remember i told you there is an object you can precisely find out where the object will be in future that's not possible in quantum mechanics you can only have what are called probability distributions you can say the atom the electron in an atom is somewhere here with 98% probability but you cannot pinpoint an exact position to that because of the nature of uh, statistical probability of quantum mechanics okay so you might have seen this orbits which are hazy around the nucleus so the idea of an orbit in the sense of something exactly moving in a circle like a car moving on a track has to be abandoned that is the reason why most of the people find it very difficult to understand quantum mechanics of course this is where the first idea of uh, uh, first theory of atoms came into picture and there is a lot of uh, mathematics that goes into it which is essentially a very simple mathematics called the linear algebra 
out of which you can derive this particular equation. You cannot actually derive this, but you can show that this is the equation which governs the uh, you know motion of atomic world, just like F is equal to MA governs the motion of bigger objects. Okay, now what is at the center of the atom? Now I'm not going to detail, but since uh, my field is atomic physics and not nuclear physics. I do not want to go into the detail of these things, but I just want to mention that radioactivity was the first phenomena uh, discovered by Becquerel, which found out that there could be something happening at the center of the atom, and Marie Curie eventually does a lot of experiments on radioactivity to find out that there is uh, a possibility of uh, you know um, particles in the center of the atom, which are called the nucleons, and Rutherford was the first one to investigate them, and we know that the center of the atom has nucleus. And further, we ask the question whether the, the proton in the nucleus is divisible, and the answer is yes, it can be divided into quarks. And there comes the field of particle physics, where particle physics has something called a standard model, which you can find all kinds of uh, various uh, uh, you know, exotic particles, like muons, pions, W bosons and all these things called what is called the high energy physics. That means the whole universe is not actually made of atoms, but these atoms are further made of fundamental particles. And this is the field of particle physics. And these fundamental electron is a fundamental particle. Proton is not a fundamental particle. Proton is, proton is made of two up quarks and one down, down quark. So this is the level at which the present theory stays and the entire universe can be understood by what is called a standard model, in which you can also see the Higgs boson, which uh, was in use for quite some time. And I would just mention about an experiment. Do I have some 10 minutes? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> so I'm coming to the last part, the last chapter. So before I come to the last chapter, see, there are four fundamental forces, gravitational force, electromagnetic. Gravitational force is a force which is, a, which is responsible for holding the Earth to the sun. Electromagnetic is the force which is responsible for almost everything that you see on the Earth, starting from digestion to everything is electromagnetic in nature. Strong force is the one which binds the nucleons in the nucleus, and weak force is uh, responsible for phenomena like beta decay. But uh, unfortunately, the first one cannot be combined with the last three because the last three can be explained through quantum mechanics and the first one can be explained through theory of relativity and there's no theory which can combine them. So this is the quest of uh, physics to see whether there is a unifying theory which can combine the first force with the last three forces. The last three forces can be understood through quantum mechanics and the first, first one can be understood only through general theory of relativity the theory given by Albert Einstein. So now we come to the last part of the chapter, which is probably uh, connecting, uh, which, which connects more closely to my subject, my field of research. So some fancy experiments. Now, can we hold the atom in one particular point? Can we study it? Can we control it? All these questions people started asking and see how an atom can be held in space. Now, there are two kinds of techniques to do that. One is called an atom trap and second one is called an ion trap. But there's a major hurdle for uh, trapping atoms. An atom is a neutral in nature, so it's very difficult to hold it because nothing, it doesn't experience any force from any electric or magnetic field. So they consider an ion first. You take an atom, you rip off an electron, you get an ion. Now, if you try to hold an ion in space by using different forces, for example, if you have a positive ion, you can put two positive ions, two sides, so that will be captured in the middle because of repulsion. But now can you put ions everywhere so that it will be held in three-dimensional space? The answer was no, because the moment you apply any kind of an electric field or a magnetic field, it will create what is called a saddle potential. By meaning, it's like a horse saddle. It will be able to stay in equilibrium in one dimension, but it will fall off from the other dimension. You can see the saddle. Here. But there comes a very brilliant idea. So what if you rotate the saddle? This is a mechanical equivalent of a saddle. You can put a saddle and rotate it. Then what will happen is every time the ball tries to fall, the pseudo wall will come around on the other side and stop the ball from falling. This idea was used by uh, 
Wolfgang Paul, and along with Hans Demel, they got the Nobel Prize for doing this uh, particular thing. And the equivalent of a rotating saddle in the electric field is oscillating electric field. They applied an os oscillating current, and that held the ion in the center. So that is called a Paul trap. So you keep all these atoms in the center of a uh, geometrical structure called a quadrupole ion trap, and you apply uh, alternating fields, you will be able to trap the ion in the center. Now, this is uh, another trap called Penning trap, where you don't use an alternating potential, but you use uh, DC potential and a magnetic field so that you can trap the ion in the center. I worked on Penning trap, so I built the Penning trap in Bangalore University, uh, and also I have built one Penning trap in Amrita University. So if you happen to visit the place, you, are, you can see this Penning trap. Basically, it traps ions in the in the uh, in in a quadrupole or other. There are other uh, geometries also. This is a quadrupole geometry. You can see that there's a ring here, and there are two end caps, one on the top, one on the bottom. You apply a DC potential between the end cap and the ring, and this atom will not be able to move in the z axis, escape in the z axis. To stop it from the x and y movement you apply a magnetic field which will result in a cyclotron motion and the particle will be ion will be trapped now how about trapping neutral atoms ions are charged so you can always trap them using uh, electric and magnetic forces but neutral atoms cannot be trapped because they don't have any charge on them so there comes this idea of what is called a magneto optic trap so basically what you do is you send six counter propagating laser beams okay and you place an atom in the center where there is a space varying magnetic field when there is a space varying magnetic field what basically happens is something called a zeeman shift will provide a force suppose an atom moves away from the center of the trap the zeeman shift will push the kick the atom toward the center of the trap by making the resonance frequency of the atom match with the uh, lasers particular frequency of the laser. So this keeps changing. So suppose an atom is moving, all of you know that if an atom is moving, it will experience a certain amount of force and that force can be used to kick the atom back into its center by a restoring force, which is provided by the Zeeman shift. So that is how people were trapping cold atoms, sorry, uh, trapping atoms. Now, you have trapped an ion or atom meaning what you have confined them into a small region of space. You might ask why one should do that. The answer is very simple. Imagine I have, uh, are you able to see my uh, my video? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, let's, let's take a book. Okay, if I take a book and I shake this book, will you be able to read what is written on it? No. no. Atoms are also moving in space all the time. So the first thing is you have to confine them in space. Otherwise, it just fly away. Now we have confined them, but it is moving within that space. It's moving. So only when you stop it, you can read it. The same way, only when you stop the atom completely in standstill, we'll be able to decipher the information from that atom. So how to do that? So that technique is what is called cooling. But before you come to cooling, let us ask a very important question. Suppose you cool the atom, such an atom, and make it stop a group of atoms. What exactly will happen? In 1925, Satyendra Nath Bose and Einstein together predicted that suppose you cool a bunch of atoms to a temperature which is almost close to absolute zero, they will behave like a single entity. It will behave like a big quantum system of a group of atoms. This is called the Bose-Einstein condensate Bs. They predicted in 1925, remember that. But it had to wait for such a long time because there was no instrument, there was no technique to cool atoms to that level. So in 1997, cool, cooling comes into picture where people actually shine lasers in counter propagating directions. So when an atom is moving in a particular direction, it actually sees the frequency to be higher than what it is. That's called the Doppler shift. So what you do is, you cheat the atom. This is a very uh, layman's way of putting it. You cheat the atom and shine a frequency which is actually lower than what it needs. 
but the atom will absorb that because it will see a higher frequency because of the Doppler shift. But as soon as it absorbs, it realizes that it's not sufficient for it to jump to the next level. Because you know, it will take up that only if the energy is equal to the energy difference e to minus e1. So there is a small difference which is deficit there because you cheated by exactly tuning the frequency of the laser slightly lesser than the actual frequency. And when the atom absorbs that, it is short of a certain energy. And that energy is used by its own kinetic energy. So the atom slows down in that particular direction. So this is a fantastic idea. And by sending six lasers in counter-propagating directions, you can actually cool the atoms. So such a low temperatures, and these are called the cold atoms. And these atoms can be uh, almost brought to, brought to uh, rest. Not complete rest because Heisenberg uncertainty principle will not allow you to do that. It can be completely brought to rest, uh, but for the uh, zero point energy. Now, these bunch of atoms, if they are atoms, then they can go into what is called a Bose Einstein condensate state. And the first time it was done in 2001, and this story is a little uh, closer to me also because the, for two reasons. One is very close to the field that I'm working in. Uh, and other reasons I will tell you shortly. So this creates a quantum mechanics at a larger scale because the whole bunch is uh, quite big. It can be made quite big and it behaves in a, in a quantum, uh, it goes into a quantum nature. This was done in 2001 uh, by Ketterly, um, uh, Eric Connell, Ketterly and Beeman. It so happens that I had the opportunity to meet uh, 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 Connell, this is on the left-hand side of the picture, they got Nobel Prize for this. And in the year 2007, BEC was actually done in TIFR India by C.S. Unikrishnan. Uh, I'm very glad to mention you that uh, he is also one of my mentors and I happened to see his lab. And it was achieved in 2007 in India in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. So this is a very fascinating e example of how a prediction uh, in, done in 1925, almost 75 years later, it was proved. And that also shows the power of both the theory and the experiment to predict such a possibility and experiment to actually do it in such a sophisticated setup uh, to actually realize the Bose science in condens condensation in 2001. Now, uh, Srinath uh, actually pointed out to this interesting experiment, which is now being carried out in space. They're trying to do this cold atom atom creation in space, where the space station, they have a lab called CAL, which uh, basically is trying to do this experiment of trapping cold atoms in outer space. Now, you might ask, uh, why should that be done? So there are several reasons for doing this uh, particular experiment. Number one, in order to trap atoms, you need very high uh, vacuum. This, these high vacuums are very difficult to actually create. But if you go to outer space, there's already up to 10 power minus 3 uh, tau pressure. So 10 to the power minus uh, 11 millibar. Okay, 10 to the power minus 11 millibar is the pressure in the outer space. So in order to create that kind of a pressure in the lab is very difficult. And the second thing is you can have microgravity means almost zero gravity. It is not that there's no gravity, but almost zero gravity in outer space. That's why you float in outer space. So these atoms can be made completely free of the influence of gravity. So these experiments are carried out at the cold atom laboratory, which is about the size of a small refrigerator. It uses laser cooling to produce temperature 10 billion times uh, colder than the vacuum of the space. Okay. So results of this research could lead to a number of uh, technologies on sensor technologies, quantum computation, atomic clocks. These are all already something that has been envisaged by uh, atom traps and ion traps. Okay. In addition to that, these things could also give in answers to the question as to what is the universe? What is the universe made of? Of course, this may not be very straightforward, but these answers can be found from such experiments. Okay, so Cal will produce clouds of ultra cold atoms of BECs. So they're planning to produce Bose Einstein uh, groups and carry out certain experiments based on 
uh, various different interests like quantum computations, which you might have heard of. The quantum computations will replace the existing uh, <clears throat> computation in the field of uh, what you call uh, cryptography, where uh, the quantum computer is capable of uh, cracking a code in a few hours compared to several years uh, that can be done by a conventional computer, which uses a transistor as its basic uh, operational unit. Okay. So all these uh, ex exclusive experiments can be now carried out in space. It has two four fold importance. One is that these atoms have now gone to a larger uh, area that you can think of like space. On the other hand, uh, it helps them to do these experiments. On the other hand, it also helps us to understand the universe. So the other experiment that, uh, that is being carried out is called the LIGO experiment. I have only a few, uh, two, three slides more. I will wind up uh, now. <clears throat> So this experiment is uh, something which uses what is called a Michelson's interferometer, which has uh, two arms, L-shaped arms. You send light in two perpendicular direction, bounce them back, and, and see whether there is a, a shift in the frequency. If there's a shift in the frequency, I mean, shift in the fringe width, that means that the path difference, there's a path difference between the two uh, lines of the light. Now, this is used for measuring gravitational waves. Now, gravitational waves are those waves which are produced by either by binary stars or an exploding supernova, which will be reaching the Earth in such a minute fashion that it is very, very difficult to detect them. Now, you might be wondering why am I talking about these experiments in the context of atoms? Okay, you can probably understand that better when you look at this particular set up. There are mirrors. There are gigantic mirrors. I told you that there are mirrors here. Okay, You look at this. There are mirror one and mirror two. And these mirrors, I am showing you one of those mirrors. You can see that. I told you that quantum mechanics usually applies to very small objects, atoms, electrons, and things like that. But it can also be made to be available in the LIGO experiment to reduce the vibrations of the mirror, the, the mirror will vibrate. Okay, Why the mirror will vibrate? Because the mirror is hung from a, a thread and this is mounted on Earth. So if there is traffic movement on the Earth, if there is any movement in the interior of the Earth, even uh, somebody banging some um, material at a very long distance can disturb the movement of this mirror. So in order to arrest the motion, motion of this mirror, they have made special techniques and the researchers uh, connected the differences between two 40 kilogram mirror. These two mirrors are 40 kilogram each. Okay, this is to stop them from vibrating in such a way that, so these mirrors, the mirrors are cooled. Further, these mirrors, mirrors are cooled and the atoms in the mirror are taken to the quantum state. The researcher reduced the mirror's relative motion to about 10.8 phonons, meaning extremely small vibrations within the mirror because of temperature. They are called quantum units of vibrations. The study purpose is not to better understand gravitational waves, but to get closer to the revealing secrets of quantum mechanics. So they did the experiment, this particular experiment, to find whether quantum mechanics works at a larger scale. But in turn, it helps to detect the gravitational wave because the gravitational wave is so weak that it is something like you drop a small feather when a, when a giant train is passing by and trying to figure out the sound of the feather. So that much weak is the signal of the gravitational wave. So in order to detect that signal, you have to reduce all other vibrations and bring the even the vibrations of the atoms within the mirror to such a small scale that you are able to measure the gravitational waves. So this is where the importance of the atomic physics comes into picture. So I think uh, I will skip this part, uh, otherwise it will take more time, but all of you are aware that Large Hadron Collider is a place where uh, a 27 kilometers radius uh, particle accelerator is uh, there in uh, across two countries, France and Switzerland, which makes experiments to collide to uh, particles which are propagating in opposite directions. And by colliding them, uh, 
they also try to find out the uh, Higgs boson. And eventually, uh, probably in the future, we are able to answer the questions such as what is dark matter and what is dark energy and whether there is a um, you know, black hole at the center of the galaxy. All these questions can be addressed by fine tuning the experiments on ultra cold atoms, the experiments on highly charged ions. By suitably modifying these experiments, one can find out various secrets of the universe Questions like whether the universe has something called local physics or local in terms of time and space. Does a physical constant like H change after one lakh years? Or if you go several million light years away, will there be a different kind of a physics? It's almost impossible for you to wait for one uh, lakh years to see whether the constant changes. But you can actually make measurements in ion trap to 16th decimal place so that if at all there is a change after one million years, which you cannot detect, you can detect that change within a year by trying to look at the 14th or the 15th decimal of that particular uh, constant, like a fine structure constant or Planck's constant. All these con constants are finely tuned in the universe such a way that the universe is in balance. If there is any difference in these values, the universe will not be in a stable state. So this is called the anthropic principle. If you and me are here in this today, it is because all these constants are perfectly tuned to that particular value. Even if that value is slightly different, we do not exist. So that means all our existence has been meticulously planned by the universe and everything else has been calculated to such a precision that it works in a perfect balance. And all these constants, all these values are calculated by uh, atomic physics, nuclear physics, and particle physics, which are basically those which probe into such small scales of uh, time and space and paradoxically revealing you the secrets of the whole universe, which is unfathomably huge. So with this, I come to the last part of the uh, my talk. <clears throat> you can see that all these different kinds of techniques spread across the electromagnetic spectrum, which is nothing but detecting the motion of atoms, which actually lets you uh, find out the secrets of the universe by probing them through different telescopes and spectrometers positioned on ground and the sky. And that gives you information about the stars, the galaxies, the black holes, and all kinds of celestial phenomena. So I thank you, everybody. And with the uh, last uh, quote of Einstein, I would like to end that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe or the world is that it is comprehensible. So it's so amazing that even though the universe is so enigmatic, so complex, we still are able through science to understand the workings of the universe. So that is very, very uh, exciting. And I'm very happy to share a little knowledge of atomic physics which has enabled me to understand some of these things. So thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. And if you have some time, I definitely would like to be. Yes, sir. So just unmuting, sir. So, so Satya, sir, you are muted. Okay. Okay, so was I muted for a long time or? No, sir. Last one word. Okay. Srinath, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, Satya. And uh, it was a fantastic uh, comprehensive compendium of atom. Uh, one small uh, correction, uh, if you forgive me. Uh, in BEC, yeah. the uh, Pauli exclusion principle may not work. That's only small uh, uh, observation from my side. I have a question. When you look yeah. at the overall, uh, the uh, the development of a physics, uh, definitely yeah. the mathematics is a, a skeleton of the overall, uh, the research development of physics. Uh, yeah. In case of, uh, exclusively in case of BEC, there is a long waiting period, uh, keeping aside the technological development. Generally, yeah. maths drives the physics. In that direction, do you have any thoughts? that physics development has suffered a 
set back or forwarded i mean that kind of a co traveling of physics and mathematics just a remark from you padan uh, can you just repeat uh, that last part no i am asking you the the co traveling of physics and mathematics which yeah. makes generally physics sometimes lagging whereas in this case of also bose einstein condensed which we see it yeah. mathematical development has like always mathematics it is ahead of the physics then physics gets the more uh, what do you called uh, development hope i have made yes. my point in that direction just remarks on what are remarks you have yeah sure so actually uh, as you pointed out uh, for example when i mentioned about uh, quantum mechanics the beginning of the quantum mechanics when uh, heisenberg made his theory uh, they were struggling to understand the mathematical structure but uh, soon uh, uh, paul dirac actually makes a statement he was the first person to actually understand that this is based on hamilton's work hamilton had done this work long back of the theory of uh, vector spaces and hamilton's uh, formalism in mathematics so mathematics had done this work long back it is only physicists as physicists we have to realize which part of mathematics has to be picked up to explain a certain phenomena so it usually so happens that most of these things have already been uh, done in maths but there are very a few examples where physicists have gone into mathematics and try to develop mathematics through uh, uh, their work wow, quantum mechanics advanced uh, advanced uh, quantum mechanics and string theory people have tried to gone into mathematics and by using the physical theories they have tried to further the in, further the development of mathematics so they say that i am a, not an expert on this but they say that people have actually uh, succeeded in uh, you know pushing the corners or pushing the boundary for mathematics uh, using the physical intuition i think that is also very much possible yeah thank you another close out of my question uh, if students want to pursue in uh, atomic physics or uh, spectroscopy yeah. what kind of opportunities will be there only a short uh, uh, answer yeah i mean uh, uh, basically i think now nowadays uh, there is a large amount of uh, companies which are coming to india uh, for example the first company which uh, came and i was uh, completing my phd was i think uh, g general electricals which was looking into hiring uh, atomic physics people but now there are there are a lot of companies and other ventures which require spectroscopies um, basically i mean even in isro for example um, one of my good friends uh, called uh, dr umesh he was the one who actually um, uh, you know um, uh, did some diagnosis on the rocket engines based on the spectroscopic uh, properties and therefore i am sure that a lot of students who take up atomic physics will be useful in many areas of uh, industry and scientific research uh, though it may not be as as good as uh, material science because that has more wide applications in in many fields so but thank definitely it's improved in this scenario is improved yeah. thank you sir any more questions students have any, any questions you can unmute and ask questions to sir also shikhat you mentioned something about pauli principle i didn't uh, no why that is the part oh, of the uh, whole atom lab which states in that uh, science description is when an atom okay. gets into bc which is called as a fifth state of a plasma where it will lose as mm -hmm. this fermi fermi exclusion principle it will not be applicable there and hence this becomes yeah. a boson so that's for the point which i brought to your notice hope i have made it is heard boson in condensate is basically a boson fermi principle is the only for fermi i think somebody wants to ask a question priya can you see uh, prakash sir i think yes someone is uh, trying to ask a question hello hello ha ah, sir 
ಅನ್ಫಾರ್ಚುನೇಟ್ಲಿ so immediately enter into this uh, because i wanted to hear you so very often i think okay. that 10 years back itself when you were doing phd you know so i recognize you as a very talented person in physics i recognize you as a scientist future scientist so that's why i wanted to hear you your especially so i just enter into this so this really uh, i got to know and i come to know your knowledge also so because you touch so many physics aspects in this talk you know so really i enjoyed it so while traveling itself okay in metro and even now i am in the bmtc bus actually but still i could uh... thank you so much yeah thank you prakash sir for attending in that uh, state much. of <laughs> bose okay so thank you i can talk atom is a building block of uh, matter but you know, put in the other way like uh, atom is the uh, gateway to the universe you know so this is a, a very fantastic title you have given actually so the first time thank i you, could know that atom is really uh, uh, gateway to the universe itself, uh, not only the uh, building block of mat- mat- matter you know <laughs> so very nice it is yes. uh, thank you satyajit thank you I'll talk to you later. I think Fine. the credit should go to Srinath sir organizing. I want to, yeah, I want to call you to our college actually. I'm working in GFGC Devanali. So I will call you as a delegate to our college once. <laughs> I hope yes, you will accept my Definitely. invitation. Thank Definitely sir. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. any other questions if not we can wind it here the uh, one question is by aditya in chat box can you take it up minute sir we can check okay. it yeah i can yes, thank sir. you so much for presentation yes. you know- uh okay so this is astronomy group and can you suggest any student project to invoke uh, astrophysics okay I, as as i told you earlier i am not into astrophysics i am an uh, atomic physicist but uh, at the same time i would like to tell you that applications of atomic physics and when you're doing uh, astrophysics there are people who are atomic physics people who are working in astrophysics areas also uh, which is how the, uh, in this case different branches of science are coming so but i i might be able to help you but at right now since i am not in this field i would not l- like to make a off hand remark on what uh, project you can do but this is a larger discussion you are free to approach me we will be able to help you with that yeah thank you for the question and thank you for your comments also so please check if no questions are there uh, you can conclude sure. with the permission of the speaker okay satya sir shall we end it here yeah yeah thank you thank you so much yeah sir one uh, thank you very much sir for engaging us with your uh, precious time and with knowledge and we are very pleasure to have you in uh, creative actually your energy and your knowledge na uh, it uh, gives more energy uh, to us actually it was a different all from uh, other sessions uh, today session was a little bit different from previous one thank you very much sir thank you giri sir uh, and uh, maya madam uh, is here and uh, prakash sir uh, thank you all everyone uh, who joined here and creative volunteers and i am here, winding here thank you one and i just want one thing before i end that is uh, even though uh, Uh, all of you have appreciated uh, my talk so much i should say that this basically has formed this kind of a talk has formed because of the creative and shina sir suggestion i was not having this kind of a thing in my mind though there were many things the way this particular way i have put them together is essentially because of 
your questions and your enthusiasm and the group of creative that has brought this particular talk in this direction. Last days I have been thinking and working on this. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, sit and learn all these things. Thank you for thank you so much. Our request, your pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes.